panel today, right? We're going to talk about um, designing mobile games for in-app purchases. Experts here to my left. I'll have some questions. We're going to leave plenty of time, though, in the end for uh, also audience questions, too, since we were fortunate to have these folks join us. Uh, maybe, Dave, you could start with the introduction yourself, and we'll move down the line. Sure thing. Hey, everybody. I'm Dave Bichelia. I run the Tap Lab, and we're a free-to-play mobile gaming studio based in Boston. I've uh, been doing this stuff for six years. Uh, uh, have learned a lot along the way in terms of implementing IAP in games, uh, what to do, but also what not to do. Uh, and I'll be sharing a lot of that with you guys today. Hello, I'm Ty Kelly. I'm a longtime game designer. I used to, well, I kind of still do write a blog called uh, What Games Are, which uh, talks about a lot of different game design things, some of them to do with revenue and monetization and stuff. A lot more, though, to do with, um, uh, I guess, kind of game design impacts and that sort of stuff. So. Um, my kind of uh, background with a lot of games as a consultant has been, in many cases, actually advocating um, elegance and simplicity and ease of use and those kinds of things over and above maybe what you might call excessive monetization. Um, so yeah, and I recently ran away to virtual reality, so um, yeah. Hey, Christian Calderon, I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Ketchup. Uh, we make games like 2048 Stack. Before I was the VP of Marketing Revenue at Dots. We made a game called Dots, and Two Dots. <laughs> Before that, I ran the revenue team at Kickside. Okay, so first, before we begin, um, I want to just, uh, I guess, a little plug, if you will. But I'm really just, uh, you know, since the talk is in-app purchase revenue, I just want to share, we recently did a survey of the landscape where we um, did a questionnaire. We were sent out to a bunch of leading uh, game publisher studios. Uh, we just recently published that. So I um, encourage you to come to our website um, to download it, just full of good information. So um, you can go to scientificrevenue.com forward slash IEP dash survey forward slash and uh, or you can just kind of navigate the sites under resources anyway so marketing people told me to had to make that mention so I'm done with scientific revenue so first course so but actually maybe call it a level setting question or set, kind of set the groundwork is um, you know I guess you know, you know would you look forward in the future you know you know is this really going to matter down the road and I say this access in light of Apple and Google's uh, recent announcements about bringing back subscriptions. You know, certainly we've all, you know, probably every session's mentioned Pokemon Go in terms of now, uh, you know, location-based sort of opportunity for um, generating revenue. So, I guess I'll ask that, you know, that first question. You know, Dave, you know, is IEP revenue here for the long term? Uh, definitely, and I think you know, there's a lot of interesting things happening right now. I mean, you mentioned in iOS 10, we're going to see. Uh, you know, subscriptions or micro subscriptions being available for developers. I don't think that's going to replace IAP. I think uh, we'll see a lot of folks doing very interesting things where they're merging subscriptions in line with an IAP model. Whether that's you know getting access to tournaments, getting access to exclusive content, or even just kind of like a loyalty program where you get weekly bundles uh, for paying that recurring fee. Um, I do think free to play IAP will continue to evolve, but will certainly continue to be here. Yeah. Um, Do you yeah. concur? Yes. <laughs> Any, Christian, is that a yes? Yeah, I agree with that. OK. But how about, so looking maybe, and we just say the same five to 10 years. So I think latest uh, eMarketer report was you know 60% of mobile game revenue right now is IEP. Do you think the trend will continue even that far out, five to 10 years? Or what would be the percentage? Um, I definitely. Um, the, the the battle over whether this is a kind of a permanent thing or not was fought years ago. And the outside of the very odd exception like Minecraft and stuff like that, it's been blatantly obvious forever that the mobile market works in this way. And it works in that very like high volume, filter a lot of people through, um, pull three, two, three, four, five percent of those people through onto a conversion line, and that is where you're going to make billions and billions of dollars. None of that is in any way I think, um, revelatory anymore. There was a point when it was. It was like, oh my god, now it's like, y y of course that's how it works. Like, we've all gone way past the point of even conventional wisdom and into, um, like, huh, you want to work at it? You want to make it different? No, you don't want to do anything else. You want to do it like this. I do think the subscription one is really interesting for a couple of specific markets, things like the kids' market particularly, because you can't really IAP the kids' market without going straight to hell. Um, so, I mean, you know, but within, this, within the, the kids' market and particularly within the parents' market, um, the, the appeal of being able to kind of have their kids play and interact with stuff and that it only costing a few dollars a month and all of that sort of stuff and that it's safe 
and that it's um, perceived as uh, protected and that kind of stuff. That is the one missing piece, I think, in the in the iOS economy um, at the moment. It's the Moshi Monsters sort of model, which hasn't really had the chance to sort of shine on uh, on mobile yet at all. And that is what what will. But outside of that, I think it's it's pretty much settled. Okay. One of the things I think is interesting is that you know over the next three, four years, mobile ad spend per user is going to increase significantly. Um, and so, I mean, we're seeing it now at Catch App where our CPMs are just, they're continuing to increase. Uh, even though that's you know 95% of our revenue, I'm curious as to um, in the future, especially with, you know, I don't know, who knows if there's like a recession in certain areas, it'd be interesting to look at how people use discretionary income and how they use uh, monetization mechanics that uh, use ad formats instead of IAP. And so I, I'm, I'm assuming that um, as ad revenue starts to increase uh, on a per user basis, that it will start to be um, it will start to be more piece of the pie than than it is now. Yeah, no, I'm yeah, I'm glad you brought that. Up. So, looking out, okay, we're we're you know, around the same ratio, six percent, or is the ratio changing? You know, the five to ten years, because it's app any or pick your favorite you know statistic, right? It's like a hundred billion revenue app revenue in I don't know 2020. Maybe. I mean, I wonder, I have no statistical basis on this at all, but I do wonder whether um, the mobile to me feels as though it may be in general kind of getting quite stale. Um, and I don't mean that to do with the, the currency. I mean the games, the whole the whole kind of ecosystem sort of overall. I find it quite interesting, of course, I say that and then Pokemon Go came out and the whole world's gone crazy. But the, for a lot of the other game formats, I, I do wonder whether it's kind of entering that sort of early Facebook, or that late Facebook stage where um, the products all kind of were what they were and the platform kind of was what it was, and yet the sort of, the the tiredness factor, the fatigue factor with the games started to kind of play a, a role in people not really being all that engaged with them anymore. So I, would it be a, a higher percentage? Yes, but I wonder whether it'll be a higher percentage of a smaller pie than people might think it is. Again, I have no, nothing to physically base that on, it just it feels like that's kind of a part of the, the picture. I think another part of it too is there, there are some regions where, you know, purchasing an IP isn't common still, like in China, for example, right? So it's going to be interesting to see, like, we as developers, we, we're training our, in a way, training our user base how how to monetize. Like for example, at Catch App, if we introduce a new game that's very strong with IP mechanics, our users may not respond to that well because they're so used to to participating in in ad mechanics, ad based mechanics. So I think as developers, as we're continuing to train, um, the, you know, the, the behavioral economics within our applications, and then in in certain regions, um, you might see people having the propensity to spend on IP where it wasn't there before. So I do see like forces going in both directions. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. To bring it, um, so and thank you for the transition back. Actually, the main topic: design the mobile games for IP. So maybe you know, starting with you, Christian, and kind of that case, like maybe can you think of you know, a game or an you know example that um, you were particularly impressed by that did a really great job of designing for IAP and why? Yeah, sure. So I'm going to be I'm going to be biased, but uh, <laughs> uh, Kicksai we made this game called Battle Pirates, uh, and I loved I, lo I loved the the systems design in that game. Um, and every update and every event, we would release um, you know a new uh, a new special unit, um, and this, the unit would, you know, be kind of like it would help the 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 users like attack, or would help them defend maybe the next month. But each month we'd come out with a really cool new unit, and everyone would get really really excited about it. Um, and the system of the of the game was actually pretty strong. Um, we would continue to increase our pool over time, um, but yeah, really. I really enjoyed the the, the the systems design, monetization design within that game. It wasn't mobile though, you know, it's a web-based game. Okay, how about, how about you talk? So, I mean, my examples are probably a little older at this point because the last sort of year or so I've been somewhat separated from like what's completely current with uh, with mobile game design. But the um, it's a bit of a, a dodge because we worked slightly together on this, but I really liked the way that Two Dots put it together. I read like uh, from the, again. I'm a sort of a simplicity advocate, so for me, I tend to, I, regardless of how the I guess the internal business may actually be working, I tend to like 
when I see um, games just doing things in a very easy and elegant way, um, because I feel like they're always building a good foundation from which they can then sort of increase. The, the issue sometimes that I've seen with some games is when they're trying to rush to the money point or kind of over provide the money point or have like 400 different ways that you can spend money. The overall effect, it turns, becomes a very fragmented sort of app. So Two Dots for me has always actually been a banner app that I always sort of point a lot of uh, clients out and I always go, look at that game, do it as simple as that first, and then you can talk about how you want to complicate it later because it's a that game is very effective at doing the simple thing. And, uh, and there's a lot to be said for that. Did that did, does that monetize well in IAP? Christian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's a great observation. So yeah. when we first introduced two, uh, two Dots, we only had a handful of things that you could purchase. Yeah. Um, and as the game evolved, um, we started introducing more complex mechanics. Uh, we started expanding the IAP product portfolio. Um, and as we did that, we would see our ARP DAO increase uh, and then we also eventually introduced ads uh, in, into the game. Uh, very light touch, wasn't, it wasn't a very strong mechanic. We were afraid that introducing two systems into the game uh, later would, it could hurt the IAP uh, economy and, and hurt how um, uh, new cohorts would come in and, 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 and have a, hurt their propensity to convert to spend. Um, but it, I mean, we we were very cautious, and so over time, you know, we introduced more mechanics, and more mechanics, um, and, and iterated and iterated in a traditional, I think, product fashion um, uh, to get ARPDAO uh, up. Um, but right now, it's it's a strong. I would say the ARPDAO for that game is pretty strong um, compared to like what you would think it would be, because yeah. when you look at it, it doesn't seem like it would be a strong monetizing game. Yeah, no, it's, to make a casual game like that. And Make it work. Right. Very impressive, um, Dave. How about you? Any? Can you think of just any examples? Could your game could be someone else's game that you just think are just did a beautiful job with the design for IP and why? Yeah, I mean it's interesting. If you're looking at revenue, obviously you can just stare at the top ten and see Machine Zone, Supercell, and King. Uh, but if you look at the top fifty, there's some really unique games there that integrate IP in, I think, super innovative ways, and they're in the top fifty, so it's working. Um, one game that I think a lot of folks overlook is, especially game designers like myself, uh, is a game called Covet Fashion. And I think that's a game that was designed like just entirely knowing the player base, um, understanding that uh, the real connection there is to the actual physical um, objects. So uh, you buy a dress or a pair of shoes in that game for your character before you send them out on the runway. Um, you actually have a direct link to buy that at a discount virtually and get the real product. And they're actually getting referral fees on those purchases, which is cool. It's like pulling in the real world in a meaningful way, and it drastically increases the percent pain. Another thing they do is they actually have tournaments uh, in the game, and the folks at the top actually will walk away with like a coach bag or a you know, pair of uh, Prada shoes. Uh, and I think from you know a design perspective, it's super unique, but also shows that they really understood their player base, and that was baked into the IAP design from the get-go. So about conversely, how about I'm sticking staying with you, Dave? Just conversely, so you know, what about a game that maybe you just thought was really great in so many different ways, but maybe it just wasn't that well I you know, oriented towards IAP and you know, maybe any thoughts along those lines? I mean, in terms of core IAP. Design. A lot of folks would point towards like Dungeon Keeper from okay. 2014, which you know I think was just as you mentioned before. There's some games that are just a little too aggressive, and a 24-hour wait to crack one block or pay uh, so early in the progression just like, proved to be far too aggressive. Um, in terms of a game that was like great but didn't perform as well as I would have expected. Um, I think Fallout Shelter is a great example, and Steve Moretzky mentioned that during his talk on Monday, is that a lot of folks, you know, we saw it skyrocket, and then we saw it slowly decline. Um, and a lot of folks thought it was gonna be a bomb, uh, and the reason why was they only had like 20 rooms and uh, like 200 people that you could unlock. And the average player was grinding through that content in like two to three weeks. Um, so they didn't really feel the need to engage with the IAP because the game was poorly balanced and they didn't do a great job with content consumption. They didn't have enough content at launch. 
Uh, another thing that Steve mentioned, which I, I think is right, is at launch they didn't really have the elder play there. Um, more recently, actually at E3 this year, um, they announced a new quest system, new combat system, um, and, and crafting, and they really baked in a bunch more content. Um, and the game's actually secured a pretty good spot in the top 100. Uh, so I think that's a, a good case study in terms of uh, you know kind of a turnaround. Um, and just the need to keep up a good content cadence um, post-launch. You know, designing for IAP isn't just leading up to launch. It's something that continues after you pull the trigger. Cool. So um, one of the things that I think sort of seems to bear out again and again with games that are uh, excellent at, at uh, converting and IAP and all that is uh, games that have a, a, you know, they're naturally built toward what's essentially a fairly single player progression loop RPG-ish sort of thing. Doesn't necessarily have to formally be a role playing game, but that it, it does have that sort of shape at the same time. And what tends to typically be the case is any game that really doesn't sort of work in that way will probably struggle very hard. So a game that no one has probably seen that I worked on a couple of years back um, called Jawfish Poker was a really good example of this. We were trying to make a, um, a synchronous multiplayer fast uh, turnaround kind of poker game. The idea is similar to like rush poker or something where you'd sort of go from table to table super fast and you have these like all in our fold kind of hands and stuff and we had currencies attached and you could buy packs and like all the usual sort of parts. But what it kept resulting in is, and games like that do, is you, res you get a very top heavy player culture very quickly. You get like your, you know, your 1% who turn out to either be very good at the game or they spend a ton of money in the game very quickly to buy their way into being very good, but they have a downward pressure on everybody else, which actually disincentivizes everybody else from, from being involved. So that's a, that's a good example. There are some kinds of games for which the IAP, not, I believe at least, will never be cracked because they simply refuse to allow the, each of the players to sort of participate at their own level and uh, refuse to allow them to kind of progress and they're just not built to do that, you know? Um, so yeah, so I, again, it's not a game anybody here has probably played, but that for me was like, yeah, that really didn't work. So, Any thoughts, Christian, to add to that? Or? So uh, games that poorly yeah, monetize? Just, yeah. So I mean, I'll say like, you know, yeah. catch up games, we don't monetize with IP. Yeah. Um, but that's because we design, uh, they're designed that way. You're, yeah, we're designing it for it at. Yeah, and so our our philosophy behind that is, um, we're we're trying to democratize basically the 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 purchase mechanics within the game, allowing everyone to to use them without having to spend money. Um, so we do this because we want, you know, we want our grandma and our ten year old daughter and everyone to be able to to use a power up without having to spend money. Um, and that's just the philosophy behind it. Yeah. Do any of you guys, um, just throw it out anyone, it's like we've done any work with like trying to create just feeder apps. So not even just necessarily advertising, but just, you know, try to create a game that is just, does so great just doing organic traffic. You don't have to hire anyone for that. But then it's just purely to drive to another game that might be more IAP oriented. And I asked because we just, we were starting recently working with a publisher and that was, they, they came to us and that's honestly they made, <laughs> I can't name them, but, um, they make beautiful games, and but you know they want us to help tune the pricing. And but we looked at it, and we're like, we just don't have any IAP hooks in there. But you know, app would feature them, and they would just get tons and tons of organic traffic. So then we help them in their strategy to like help them kind of just tips on what to have in to like power ups and a lot of other different things to, to have in their games. So they made a whole new game, but then all the other games were just just drove just massive traffic. So in this case, we did they didn't do add so much as much as trying to feed it right into the other game. And if you had any similar experiences? I mean, I personally, not directly, no, but yeah. I've seen that mechanism play out since, geez, since Facebook 10 years ago. Like, that was the, the basic, um, the basic uh, loop with a lot of games. You know, all those, like, you know, what superhero are you kind of crappy apps and stuff. The ones that got, like, millions of people to go, oh, I want to know what that is. Mm -hmm. But a huge amount of their business for a couple of years was essentially acting as, a, like, an advertising platform for Zynga games. So like Zynga would pu would purposefully put advertising out into millions of other games on a constant basis. Machine Stone was doing exactly the same thing with uh, with its uh, overwhelming amount of video ads that appear usually often in other games, right? So, and and it seems like it's at least for a while it's a very um, productive kind of way for a lot of kind of minnows to to at least kind of do something, you know. 
Um, so they can get access to a lot of players while at the same time remaining free or relatively free or mostly free, you know? I don't know much about the story, but I've heard through the grapevine that Cookie Clicker was actually a feeder app, uh, and the dev just the made what? it Cookie Clicker, oh, okay. which is like one of the early idle games, mm -hmm. and the dev just made it, released it for free with the idea that it would draw people into the rest of his portfolio. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more to that, but uh, you know, it certainly has worked for folks. Yeah. Just um, mention, I can, kind of I can talk a little bit yeah. about that too, because yeah, um, we do a little bit of cross promotion at 2048 or at Catch App, and a lot of that was from 2048. Um, and then also uh, from Dots to Two Dots. Um, Dots is a really strong feeder app for Two Dots because it's constantly featured. Um, it can work and it can not work. Where it works is when you have a feeder app that is has a strong affinity towards the app that it's pointing to. Um, and in that case, you see yield accretion across the, 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 the cross promotion. Um, you could also have a, a situation where we, throw, uh, we could have users in our portfolio and we point them to a particular application um, and there's strong decay in, in retention. And in a situation like that, it's it's not accretive, right? Um, so you can have positive and negative effects. When you're managing a portfolio of almost 100 applications, it's extremely important to look at our network uh, lifetime value and our portfolio retention. And so we really care about that. We want to make sure that um, if we're sending users to a game, that they're happy, that they're enjoying it. So some of the things that we look at are, are reviews. Are, are users giving us five-star reviews or are they giving us two-star reviews? Is the retention strong? Are they staying within our portfolio or within our network? Or are they leaving? Um, so those are things that we care about. Um, and I have seen it done well. I think with Dots and Two Dots is a great example. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see Two Dots and uh, Dots' new game, Dots & Co., when that comes out. Cool. Uh, excellent. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up, too, because it kind of reminds me of another you know, example where we're working with someone just I just did some fabulous. Anyway, I don't well, on that topic anymore, we actually, let's get into, I want to, Todd, you mentioned something I thought was interesting because you brought up video, right? So, rewarded video, obviously, been very, you've done a fabulous job in terms of revenue with my two, but is there, does it work with IAP at all, or is it just an either or situation, or what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think, I'm not entirely sure, to be really yeah. honest. Like, it's, it seems like it, it's probably half and half. Like, I, I don't have a lot of, um, it's probably better actually if you ask yeah, the other guys I, this because I, I have a lot of like deep yeah. numbers to really sort of kind of talk meaningfully about whether that actually works or not. You know, I can talk experientially about it, but and I'm not just sure. ask because I had a couple examples that were you now I can you know where, where they actually were using rewarded video. They actually found that just by giving a little bit of coin, then all of a sudden they were doing more purchases. So I'm just curious if you guys have seen that or else had a similar experience with that. I think a good case study for opt-in ad integrations is Idle Games. And actually, Christian, in your talk, you mentioned the supercharger in Mario's game Doomsday, um, which is a like great mechanic, and it ties into the core mm -hmm. loop of the game. Um, and in terms of how you integrate IAP with that, I mean, for the supercharger, you can actually buy a premium um, purchase that increases the multiplier, so I think you definitely can do that. Um, and again, idle games, I mean, we're seeing like 60% of our revenue in soft launch for a game we're working on coming in from opt-in ads. And there's some other good case studies out there, like games like Farm Away. So uh, pulling back in deck to a little more, I guess, a tactical panel, like for um, you know, design for IP. So um, do's and don'ts. So you know, love to hear from actually each one of you. So if you kind of when you you know you're building a new game, do you have like a list of do's and don'ts that you look at, you think about as you're designing a game, particularly with an eye towards um, IP monetization. So I think uh, do is uh, try to make sure that the first purchase that somebody is uh, making is fairly incidental and small, so that it's not, it doesn't sort of scare them off a lot. Because you, you do want to get into that, I guess, like habituation sort of state of mind, right? You don't want them to feel that it's um, kind of all or nothing, and you don't really want them to feel like um, the the game is just going to be at, like avariciously tapping their wallet like on a constant basis. So that's a good do. Don't is... Um, don't try and bail the user before it's actually pretty obvious to them that the game is valuable to play. Like, don't. And I do. I, it's amazing. Like, eight, nine years after all of this kind of stuff really sort of became part of the regular, like, what we do as part of an industry, it's still amazing to me how many devs kind of get that really wrong. 
you know, or like that they just kind of, it's almost like you get to the title screen, you press once to tap a jump, and suddenly it's like, now oh, for $10 you can, you know, type of thing, you know, or it feels that way. The abruptness, the, uh, the, the kind of terror that if I, like, stay in the game a minute longer than that and don't pay for something, then, we have, like, I'll leave and that's it. Like, And it, it's amazing how, how that kind of panic, if you like, almost, with uh, particularly with a lot of indie small studios, people trying to get started and stuff, how much that panic plays into their thinking. So, so don't do that. Yeah, great point. I mean, if, I don't know if you can expand on that. And like, how do you know when, <laughs> it's like, I agree. Yeah, it always makes total obvious sense that, yeah, don't, you know, give them something to buy when they're just not ready. You want to get them hooked, you want to get them, you know, right. engaged, but is it just a I feel? Or do you have any metrics? Or do you th there are, there are some thoughts that, it, like, the kind of the four to seven minute kind of areas okay. are sort of a good time. There's some thoughts that say the 15 to 20 minute area is a good time. Like, there's a lot of, um, uh, I guess kind of causal analysis that sort of like tries to kind of figure that out, but it does sort of fall at the point of well, every game is kind of different. So if you're talking about games that are exactly the same, then sure, you can probably figure out a commonality. But it it does come down to a lot of feel. It comes down to that point where it feels like the the pinch is worth it, rather than the the, the pinch is arbitrary or forced or blatant. You know, um, and th th those tend to be the most. I think at least those tend to be the most can easily overcome sort of pinches, whereas the pinch is too soon or too, or too late, then it, um, it, can, it can very easily go either way. Going a little deeper on that, uh, starter packs actually do work, um, but to Tag's point, you don't want to slap that in someone's face right out of the gates. What we do is we actually have them available in the shop um, out of the gate, but we don't push it to you until you've spent about five to 10 minutes in the game, which is also in line with those targets. Another thing is, you really should soft launch and look at your data to figure out, you know, the point where players actually become truly engaged, um, and you know that varies from game to game. Uh, the only other thing I throw out there is, you know, I I do think Supercell does a fantastic job of teaching you how you know these currencies work and their value in the game without forcing you to buy them. Um, and I know a lot of folks who have taken that and said, oh, I'm gonna show someone how to buy something right out of the gates, and they're showing you how to spend 99 cents rather than giving you a bunch of free stuff, getting you in that um, uh, kind of process and habituating that kind of, okay, I'm using these resources and, and progressing. Um, that's just, you know, I think they've mastered that art. Um, Going back to the, the do's and don'ts, where it was kind of the, the list of do's and don'ts. Yes, yeah, so I think um, I can say, don't not communicate how how sinks and, and faucets are, are work. So I'll give you an example. Um, Summer's War is a game I've spent maybe 700, 800 bucks in. Um, and it's not the easiest game to play. Like there's a lot of mechanics in there that are pretty complicated, a lot of different systems and stuff. But they do a surprisingly good job of communicating how everything works, surfacing uh, purchase options and bundles and uh, all kinds of, the, 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 the portfolio of things that you can buy is massive. Um, and there's synergy within items um, and that, they, that they give to you. Um, the complimentary goods, it's, it's an awesome game from modernization mechanics, it's a solid, solid game design. But the thing they do really good, which is awesome, because it's, it's, it's a Korean game, they, they communicate very well on making purchases, um, and they they don't they're not shy of, of servicing uh, promotions to you either. So I think because of that, you know, when I see a promotion, oh, okay, it's fifty percent. I'll buy that. Um, they do a really good job at communicating, and I think that's for me, it's really important. Um, it's what makes. I mean, if they didn't communicate so well, I probably wouldn't have spent seven hundred bucks in the game. I actually reinstalled Game of War last week and actually allowed push notifications. And like, I think they do do a fantastic job in the game of, of messaging these, these deals by having those limited time offers and the bundles that are real valuable. But every like 15 seconds, I get hit with another push notif about an other limited time offer. Mm -hmm. And that must work, mm -hmm. like, because they have the data. They wouldn't be doing that if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But for me, I just, <laughs> I was like, man, I can't handle this. Uh, yeah. Another one I'd have is uh, for a, well, it's kind of a do and a don't at the same time, yeah. so um, which is confusing. So do engage in uh, promotional kind of activities, you know, to sort of like entice people in, but don't 
make the mistake of completely training your audience that that's going to happen so often that that's what they just wait for kind of all the time because you effectively devalue the base of the game if you do that. So we, we had a, with the same game that I mentioned earlier with Jawfish Poker, we had happy hours and like a lot of games have done. And we would see like six times conversion and it was fantastic and stuff. And then after about a week, we would see zero conversion all the rest of the time because we was like, bugger, we've trained them to think that actually everything is 50% off all the time and we can't get out of that. You know, so th like if you're going to engage in um, uh, kind of sophisticated kind of promotional activity like that to encourage people, do it, but don't send a, a notification every 15 seconds and don't make it so regimented that it will, that's the, to them, that's when the shop opens. All right, um, Dave. You, I mean, you mentioned about um, you said look at your me metrics, right? Look at yeah. analytics. So actually, it, it actually remind. I had a conversation. It was yesterday. It was with a large Chinese game dealer. Very successful, actually. <laughs> it was just. It's it like, you know, I was actually kind of blown away that the same day if you do not look at analytics, and which is sort of okay. I'm a data company. That's all we do. <laughs> it's yeah. actually so. I got over being offended for you know that, and I, but I was curious about that, right? They said no. A good game design doesn't matter. And I asked you about just. I'm just curious, in you guys, you know, your opinion on like, you know, what metrics are important are you for like telling you that you're actually on the right track for, you know, building a game that's going to monetize well? Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing that I keep on coming back to uh, is a poorly balanced game can severely dilute your IAP. Um, and that example from er earlier, I mean, I think um, Fallout Shelter was a game where, you know, it was balanced in a way that felt really good out of the gates and got a lot of progression, but the average player was actually like basically playing the entire game in two or three weeks. Um, and you don't really know that stuff until you start getting real data and focusing on those analytics. So I, I think you can do a great job with IAP and screw up the um, you know progression and balance of the game and, and not really reap the benefits from that IAP integration. I think the one that I've always kind of found more truly indicative of, of like real potential or not is um, the median playtime. So right. median playtime, like not the not the average, obviously, because you'll get you know highs and lows. Yeah, but the median, like on a day-to-day -day basis, like the 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 absolute fifty percent user, how long are they going to stick around in the game or not, and how frequently and how often and stuff. If that is low, if that behavior is low, then you're really in trouble. Because it just indicates that your game doesn't have the substantial depth enough to probably sustain itself enough to encourage enough people to become shoppers. It just and it won't. So it sounds cheesy, and in fact, it's the most cliched thing when talking about this kind of stuff. You always have to say, oh, "Design a good game," but it's it's very reflected in if people only spend thirty seconds in your app, then <coughs> you're not going to sell them anything. But um, if you can get people spending 10 and 15 and 20 minutes on a median level, then you have potential and you can figure all the rest of it out as you go, but they will, you'll have eyeballs. And that's the, that is the primary asset. Everything else kind of falls out if you don't have that. So. Right. Any, Christian, any sort of key metrics or you know, what do you like to look at to know you're on the right track? What tells you? Um, mainly, I, I try to have like a unified um, like vision around lifetime value within my product marketing team. So I try to bring in, and there's always, in every organization, you might have you know, some problems with product marketing. So I like to bring those teams together by unifying them around lifetime value. And then breaking down lifetime value um, into like, you know, feature sprints and we're attacking different stages of lifetime value, whether it's retention, the retention side or the monetization side. Because um, at the end of the day, we're marketing the game, and um, from a user acquisition perspective, we need to continue to increase lifetime value. Um, so it always boils down back to LTV. Okay. Makes sense. You guys, so anyone looks at repeat purchase rate pretty closely? Okay. We just, for us, we found that. It's, like a, it's actually one of our kind of base, and we only can be effective with games of a certain size mm -hmm. through machine learning and data. So it's usually like one of our kind of qualifying questions. That, at least a 20% repeat purchase rate, otherwise we should be out. Yeah, I mean, earlier Tag mentioned uh, the idea of making sure that first purchase is accessible. Yeah. And I think the reason for that is, you know, you really can extract a lot of value from conversion. Um, I heard a stat that's like, on average, the next purchase after the first purchase occurs within the first hour and 40 minutes um, across all mobile games. Uh, so again, onboarding people 
to that first conversion, um, you're going to see it. I mean, they're substantially more likely to pay again after that first purchase, even if it is a you know a oh, fraction of a penny. I have another do. Uh, do you read Will Luton's book? Sorry, Will Luton. He's sitting out there. Um, he wrote the free to play book a few years ago. And read that book. I'll tell you a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll add yeah. to the first purchase thing. Um, in a user acquisition setting, it's interesting because that's a like you mentioned, it happens within hours. It's an event that ha fires off pretty quickly. So if I tag that as event, and then it's firing off, and I'm sending that to my partners, um, if you know that someone makes a purchase, their lifetime value curve starts a little bit earlier. Um, so whether or not it ends at the same place in 180 days or whatever, however that turns out for that cohort, you know that that cohort's going to be pretty pretty nice. So I. There's tons of metrics you can look at, right? Repeat purchases. I can look at average time to add view. I can look at all kind our people. We have so many freaking metrics in our in our industry. Um, uh, so it's there's tons of stuff that you can look at. Um, but I, I do like the first purchase metric. Mm -hmm. But I, I'd go back to saying LTV is is the best metric to look okay. at. Yeah. Great. Well, um, you know, we talked a little bit about subscriptions and how actually they can kind of coexist you know, with you know, IAP. Um, any other kind of recent trends or things you've seen that sort of just are, are interesting to you that you know we think we should all keep an eye out as we you know look the rest of the year and next year? Yeah. I mean, I think CPMs are going up, so yeah. I think it's interesting. I mean, this ad, ad monetization is is going to get really cool, really creative, um, and I I have yet to to see a game. It's incredibly hard to do. We've all tried it. Maybe some are better than others that have integrated an IAP and ad monetization system really, really powerfully and really, really well. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting with micro subscriptions and stuff. Uh, I really want to see a developer pull that out. I've seen developers pull off amazing ad monetization mechanics, um, really amazing IAP monetization mechanics. I have yet to see it integrated uh, extremely well you know, both at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do. Um, so it's going to be interesting looking at King because I know that they're going to Start putting ad ads in their games. Uh, I want to see how what they're what they're up to. Um, uh, I'll be honest. I haven't been able to do it well myself. Yeah. Um, when I when we incorporated it into two dots, we did see a little bit of drop off in in conversion. Um, overall, it was higher, but I think it could have been done better. Um, so it, it's going to. Uh, I I want to see that happen. So. Um. Any yeah. innovative yeah, ideas too? Also, any trends? Anything? The, I, I was going to say the subscription one actually is the innovative idea yeah. for me. Like the a lot of the rest of the stuff, um, the, like the the tension between uh, IAP and and uh, ad models that's actually quite long standing. Like, and it's not because it does come down to does the player feel that you are kind of messing with them? Like, are you are you really just kind of like pulling them from pillar to post and stuff? Because it's and that's fundamentally not a good experience. So with a lot of players on a sort of a just a fairness level, some of them will feel it's either fair to advertise at them or it's fair if they've bought stuff for them to be kind of left alone. And and that tension can be very hard to overcome. The um, the, sub the subscription one is that that is the interesting thing. That's the thing that I think will actually allow a lot of rethought in um, in game design in mobile again. Um, and which is I think something that the, the sector actually quite badly needs just as a, to sort of broaden its palette once more. You know, like there is a there is a thing with the very kind of metric led and analytical led uh, philosophy that tends to dominate mobile. That it, it does tend to kind of try and result in uni games like that. You know, it's all like, well, whatever Supercell has done, that's what we will do. Like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it tends to it tends to really, I guess, frame a lot of choices too negatively and too like with too small a space. So the idea that there's an option that isn't like that you don't just have to lock into a role-playing game curve. Um, it opens a lot of doors that may lead to a lot of innovations that may in turn feed back into how IAP is created and in turn may change a lot of the conventional wisdom, which would really be a good thing. The one thing I would say is, you know, obviously everyone is looking at the charts and seeing Pokemon Go at the very top. I, I do think it's an enigma. Um, and I think I'm allowed to say that because I've spent five and a half years making these games, but yeah. it's the perfect cocktail of a, a, a studio that spent six years building some great technology uh, and the perfect IP set up with that. Um, but in terms of things that I think are interesting, it'll be fun to watch. Um, 
the way that in and IAP design, the way that um, the lure modules work is actually really interesting and compelling because it's almost like this uh, IAP that has this um, real world social payout. Um, and, and I'm wondering how that will evolve, if, if other games will be able to pull that off. It's something that we always wanted to do, but we actually never reached the scale where that was viable. Um, and the last piece is you know, the fact that they are bringing in um, kind of sponsored Pokestops. It's something that you know, folks were talking about in 2009 when Foursquare and Gowalla and all those companies were there. But I think a real game with compelling mechanics can drive better conversion on those types of interactions. Um, but it's still to be seen. I mean, look, I hope that you know, geo games can be a category that sustains in the charts. But um, I wonder if another IP would be able to even get you know, like one tenth of that uh, response. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty dubious that that. Yeah. Like, I, I suspect it's kind of a non-repeating event, but yeah. um, that's just purely my own hunch. Uh, so the panel talks a little bit about IAPs um, getting devalued through sales. I was wondering how they felt about intentional inflation to to battle that within economies. Intentional inflation to battle devaluation from continued sales. So with our with our failed example, um, that's we tried that a lot. We we had a lot of um, oh my god, we've sold them too many coins. Let's jack up the prices of things or like. But it became a running battle because then you you get into the uh, the situation of they start to learn that you will do that, so they in turn start to learn to when you're going to recruit. We have to recorrect and. It just doesn't um, like an actual economy kind of running away with itself. It it ultimately doesn't um, it, it doesn't really yield a good sort of young long term result, or at least it didn't for us. Um, I think the the smarter thing is to actually kind of take the hit and let the sales die off and let the players kind of be, I guess, dissatisfied for a while, and then slowly and slowly allow them to effectively revalue kind of once more. You know. It's very tempting, I think, with a lot of this kind of stuff to over-tactically optimize. Um, but changing things too often and changing things too frequently kind of turns into a perpetual panic. And you end up actually screwing your own game up. So, which I'm we the, did. I'm in the camp that purchase behavior for um, IAP for many games is fairly inelastic. So like, I think there is a point to where you can increase price and you can see an overall increase in revenue. Um, but I think you know for that, for that, it's I think different for every game, for every like audience and user base. Um, but I have seen that a lot, especially with like mid more core titles, um, like more price and elasticity, which is, has always been fascinating to me. Yeah, I mean that's interesting in, in line with the uh, gem packages and games. I don't know if you guys remember back in the day, everyone's smallest package was ninety nine cents. Now, none of them are 99 cents, and that's because <laughs> <laughs> the conversion rate's basically the same. <laughs> uh, so what should that, that lowest price be if it's not 99 cents? Like, yeah. where does it stop? I mean, I, I, I think 199 is what I see as the average, um, but um, I, I think it varies from game to game as well. Um, you know, more hardcore games are actually able to provide, I think, more value in those um, purchases and therefore they can set a higher bar for that initial payment. Um, but again, uh, you know, another thing I've seen recently is a lot of folks with starter packs are actually pricing them substantially higher than I, I think makes sense. And it goes back to Ty's point, like I think getting, providing a bunch of value and making that initial purchase feel really good, particle effects everywhere, you know, um, that make the bundle complete and three um, X what they expect. Uh, you'll get much better conversion rates. And we've done that, and we learned the hard way by being a little bit, uh, not giving uh, giving enough up front and trying to price things too high up front. Um, and you realize you can actually ramp things up to kind of baseline economy uh, from there. Yeah, I really, um, yeah, I think it's interesting if, if you look at like different regions and different countries and um, those countries' purchasing power, and like, maybe, well, maybe like countries. I don't know. Like, uh, I'm sorry if anyone's from Russia, like Russia or Brazil, you might have lower purchase points that could have increased conversion. Um, I'd actually want to ask Scientific Revenue yeah. okay. what they think on this topic. Global yeah. price adjustment. Yeah, it's usually actually one of the first things. So yeah, I, I, 
Thank you for that lead-in. Um, <laughs> How much were you paid to say that? I will pay drinks later. Um, no, actually, it's, we we're kind of amazed. I and mean, we it reminds me of a conversation I had with someone. It's like, you know, oh no, no, we don't worry about Brazil. We don't make any money there. I'm like, yeah, that's the point. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like so we will see lots of you know, we, traffic is just huge all over you know Eastern Europe and Southeast Asia and India and Brazil and other places. And you know, but then the conversion of payers doesn't happen. So what we think is nice is both you know Google and Apple now have lower prices here. So we absolutely take advantage of that opportunity for a lowering price. And we're amazed even large publishers are doing quite well that mm -hmm. just don't go in. Part of it, it's because it's a pain and we're able to do it pretty easily through our tool set. But um, yeah, it usually you could get like, it depends on the game, you know, whether it was work well overseas or not, but we can get like 10% lift just from optimizing price there. But important thing to remember is, you know, a $700 phone in India is the same as $700 phone in here. So <laughs> that's why we're kind of very specific on, I mean, because we're able to because we're engine, but you know, segment players out and target them accordingly. I had a, actually another question for you, if you don't mind. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so one of, one of the things that I was looking at recently, we we're designing a new game, and we're wondering like how many purchase points should we have? Like how many price, how many options should we have? We're looking at some games, and they have so many options, and I'm wondering is that helpful because it's it's easy, it, it caters to different types of purchasers. Um, or is it better to narrow it down, make it simpler, because you can you can bundle things differently, and you can have optically you can have different conversion points and 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 uh, with your actual real money compared to like the currency or whatever whatever you're selling. But I was always curious: have you seen is there any difference in conversion? We have way more purchase points than than fewer. Well, so I, I mean, I think you, you guys all know this better than I do. But from a design point of view, what you just said you touched kind of pointing to what you said, simpler, yeah, so clear understanding, so, but what we do is we'll create hundreds of price skews. So while, you know, simpler, so we'll, we'll do two things. We'll kind of tune the storefront and we'll be, we'll change it. We'll actually even reorder badges. We actually have gotten lift from just where the default button is on the game. And it, again, it's kind of driven by data in the back and it says what's the right thing. Or we'll use promotional messaging or it offers with it is another way. So we want mul lots of choices because one thing you can never have anyone kind of understand is that no one should be aware that prices are different. And we're very, very careful and cautious about that. But so we do see, you know, we think more is the better, but how you design and making sure it makes sense. If it's, you know, I think Dave, you said you don't want to annoy someone too early with trying to, I want to try to sell you something. Um, so most important, you know, I think it's the main topic in this whole conversation is about designing your game first for engagement and then having the right hooks to, you know, yeah, I'm willing to pay something for it, uh, but then then past that, figuring out the right price, the right time is key. Yeah, I, th I thought I was having a brain fart recently when I, I looked at the store in Clash Royale, uh -huh. and they no longer have like the best value or like most popular or like 20% off, 30% off. It's just like six packages with prices. That's it. And I don't know if that's just because they're like, it doesn't fucking matter because we're Supercell, mm -hmm. or if those just don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'd love to know the thinking behind that, even if there is thinking behind that. The, the interesting too, I was looking at Candy Crush, and we were looking because we're designing, we're designing this game, we're trying to figure out what what we should do, like you know, money to currency, and we're looking at the different discount curves, yeah. and Candy Crush actually got more expensive <laughs> as you bought higher bundles. Yeah. And I'm like, what the heck? It's just like, yeah. <laughs> And then, like the very last one, you get like ten percent off or something. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> well, so you know, Steven, every other game wasn't like that. It got cheaper and cheaper as you bought higher bundles. So actually, there was a recent, um, actually, economic report where they talked about Candy Crush. So I can't remember, that. but Stephen Levitt is the author, right? So Freakonomics, you know, what I'm he, they actually looked at King Candy Crush too, and so um, yeah, they, 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 their, their conclusion actually was more research should be done. You know, other economists. Um, but it was, it was interesting. So I, was I remember um, um, a few years ago, I attended a, uh, a session by um, Amazon at the time because they were pushing you know Kindle very hard, and they had actually done a lot of sort of deep dive on their the purchase behaviors of people within their platform. They were also, in fairness, claiming that they had like a much higher conversion rate than everybody else, and blah blah blah, which is because they only had like ten users. But the um, the, but it was kind of a fun, it's like, we well, like convert 20 times more. And you're like, yeah, but come on, from eight people. Right? But the um, but one of the, the kind of little tidbits that just in the middle of all that that came out was one of the researchers said that he thought the optimal number of options to present to people was six. Um, and like a fairly easy curve of like two, seven, 12, 20, 30, 99, if you want to like have the, the, the top end one. 
and uh, that they had seen a lot of games that had, had attempted to have 400 price points or whatever, or multiple pages particularly, and that you would always see a huge fall off on page two and page three. It just it didn't matter. And also that they had seen a lot of games where they had very kind of sophisticated pricing, like $2.73 for 100 coins and that kind of stuff, which also tend to make people go, huh? You know. So again, it actually brought the argument back to it's a tough choice to make, but six options or so tends to be about right. Yeah. Easy prices that people can relate to tends to be about right. A lack of maybe only one label that kind of points people toward best value tends to be the right thing to do, and it's a good base on which to then build from. Right? Uh, most we see six, too, but I would just, again, just don't do one size fits all. Right, right, right. Yeah. Or, or always, right side, you know, in terms of pricing. Yeah. I always wonder if the most pa popular sash is just like an artist is just like, let's put it on that one. Yeah. Like, <laughs> do they actually take the numbers and move it around based on what's selling them? I think it's always like the third row, right? Yeah. Whatever, the, whatever the third one is. Best value. There yeah. you go. <laughs> think so? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So the I, I think I mentioned, sort of glossed over it pretty quickly, but was that, you know, making sure people don't find out. Because, yeah, what you do not want to have is certain, so... No one should be in game session and then seeing like, oh my god, the price is different, right? And the one thing that we do is we have a notion of persistence built in our framework, which is basically after three, you have academic literature and our experience has informed us that after three days, take your six, you know, options there, you don't remember what the price was. Like, you didn't, six, after three days, when you drove by the gas station, you look at the price of the different choices, you do not remember those prices, and I challenge anyone to really know that. So when you look at it and do a screen grab or participate in the community, it's because you have a notion that there's some different you know, pricing that's going on too. So we're very careful at that. So three days if you've actually looked at the paywall, five days if you actually made a purchase, we figure you might have stared at it a little bit longer. Um, doesn't mean we can't do stuff to convert you with pricing, right? That's kind of coming back into having specials or you know, interstitials, whatever, or you go to a lobby in a social casino game, you're used to seeing some sort of special there. Um, in our case, the way we do it is just very targeted. So it's like, you know, and so that might be a del different offer delivered to a, a different player, but yeah, it works out. All right, so so we were at, a, so this is at KickSci, and we had a core game, and we tested out a discount in a, in a country. And the, our core players found out about it, and they all changed, they all got VPN and changed their IP addresses to that country to get the discount. So be careful with giving discounts in core games. That's the yeah. lesson of this. That shows real engagement. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it didn't happen to us, but yeah, it's, that, that's core. Player. Yeah, and it's one game that one publisher told us also a similar story. Players are sneaky. That, uh, yeah. Also, the first panel of the day that had an encore, yeah. which was great. Yeah. But <laughs> still, my view, my view is that if someone's going to VPN to get that, that's a lot of work. They actually deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you all. I guess we can.